Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our session uh, titled Ungrading Underground, Why Rating Students Undermines Learning and What to Do Instead. Uh, we have a, a group of leaders here um, that I think they'll all introduce each, each of themselves, but we have Christy Bloxham, um, uh, Carla Enders, uh, Jesse Jones, Donna Brown, Jeff Sheen, and Elisa Taylor, who will be leading today's discussion. Um, they were all part of one of our Empowering Teaching Excellence Learning Circles. And those are uh, what I would call a bit of a glorified book club or an intelligent book club, where they get together and not only discuss um, pertinent topics, usually around a book like this one was ungrading, and, um, and ways that they can apply uh, the topics they're doing in their classrooms and um, share those uh, across disciplines with one another. And um, they're very productive circles that are facilitated by our empowering teach the ETE um, committees and individuals and a way to help you definitely improve your teaching and ways that you can do, uh, ways to do your practice a little better. Um, I did read the book on grading and um, the only, I like to have a visual to kind of get things off. And the only visual I could provide with that one, uh, not the book, but thank you, Elisa, <laughs> is my yoga mat. And the reason I have my yoga mat is um, ungrading. When I started reading it, I had something completely different in mind. And then when I started to sort of think about it, I, it really made me sort of have to stretch, thus the yoga mat and think about different ways that I would approach my teaching and do assessment within my classrooms. And so with that, I'd like to turn the time over to Donna who will kick this off. And I hope you will all enjoy this session. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Hi, everyone. So like we said, we're gonna talk a little bit about our experiences with the book, Ungrading. I think many of us went into this when we first started reading the book with the expectation that it was going to give us some sort of formula or set rules for ungrading a classroom. And instead, it, as John said, it really made, I think each of us stretch um, to see the possibilities. The book itself has 15 different authors that share their experiences with attempting ungrading in a classroom. Some of them were K-12, some are higher education, some are humanities, some are STEM, some are social sciences. It goes across all sorts of disciplines, which was the wonderful thing for us about working together as a, a circle because we also crossed a variety of different disciplines, yet we had so much in common to talk about. This all came about because um, Travis, Thurston had been looking at this as a, a possibility for a learning circle, and he knew of my interest um, in ungrading, though I'd only been sort of dipping my toes in at that point, um, but asked me to read it and see what I thought, and I thought it was wonderful. So then, of course, when I went back and said, yes, this would make a great learning circle, he said, good, you're it. So um, I got to lead this wonderful group, and I will tell you, we've gained so much from this that we're planning to continue working together as a group um, moving forward, looking at other materials, other books, other readings, to try and continue our learning in this area. Um, what we're gonna do today is several of our group are going to share their experiences, what they tried during spring semester, what they discovered worked, what didn't work as well, how it impacted the students, what sort of feedback they got from the students, from the experience. I think everyone was pretty open with their students about what they were trying to do and what we were trying to accomplish. For me, I get to experiment this fall. Um, I didn't teach a formal class in the spring, so I'm jumping in, what, all feet, all head, all arms and legs, wouldn't you say, Elisa, to really dig into this whole concept of ungrading. So I'm gonna pass it on. We are going to proceed and just present. And then we will ask you to hold your questions until we're done. And we have left time at the end for you all to ask us questions. So Carla, over to you. All right. 
So Carla Endress, I'm an associate professor of biology and I'm located on the Blanding campus of the statewide campuses. So I teach a variety of biology courses, um, often for pre-med, pre-nursing, things like that, challenging courses. And when I started with this group, I was um, a bit daunted, like how, how would I even do this? How would I approach this? But I jumped in as Donna said, and um, started with just dropping an exam and changing it to a portfolio. So what I did is I asked the students to think about four or five big questions on our unit, on our module that they'd like to understand better and then to create a portfolio. Now this set them back like they went into panic mode. How do I do this? What do you want? What are you looking for? And I kept saying, it's, it's up to you how you approach this. So I, I had them proceed and ended up getting some pretty awesome results. And I'm going to share one with you because this student went way above board. So she um, created a Jeopardy game. And hopefully this is showing up for you guys. So she created an entire Jeopardy game um, on our module. And I believe this was on the heart or cardiology. I'm, I'm not exactly, I can't remember for sure which one because I did several after this one. But she went to the effort of creating this entire Jeopardy game that was very involved um, as far as what the students would um, experience and learn. And what she did is she ended up sharing this with the course, with the class, so they could practice um, their, their learning. And this took her hours and hours to complete. Um, I had other students that did much more simplistic. They did sketches and drawings that had a lot of labeling and detail. But what they did is they put their efforts, because I emphasize that the mastery is what we're really after, not memorization. We're after mastery. Students loved this. They came back and told me they, they learned so much more because they didn't have that anxiety and that pressure from an exam. What's coming up? How am I going to memorize all this? So... I'm continuing in the fall um, with a different course and I'm integrating more and more. I'm not doing the whole course like Donna, but I'm integrating more and more assignments as I go out through this year. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carla, that was awesome. Um, I'm Jesse Jones. I'm an assistant professor of practice. Um, I coordinate the Outdoor Adventure Leadership Program um, in the Kinesiology and Health Science Department. And I got into this book mainly because most of my education or my teaching, my pedagogy is, is based on experiential learning. And I'm within that context, there's a lot of uh, awesome ways to grade and assess, but there's so many intangibles that it makes it difficult to put a grade on some, some of the, the things that are, my students are doing. And so this book really, I know uh, Donna said there's not a recipe here, but it really helped to help frame some of the concepts like, uh, uh, do redo resubmit um, some of the, the my reflection exercises that I was doing um, but one of the things that really helped me um, especially with my teaching evaluations was the concept of, of the one-on-one -on -one meeting with students uh, one of the things that uh, my IDA scores and some of the reflections I get back from students um, is that the class is, is good we're moving on objectives but I'm not that they had a hard time feeling like the assignments were super clear, um, especially because, you know, most of the learning is done out in the field. And so one of the things I learned from the book and also from past experiences is the idea of um, meeting with my students out of class. But the hard part is it's really hard to get my students to come in. I think you guys get that same experience with meeting with me during the semester, even if I put a, a, a point um, uh, item on it. And so what I decided to do, especially from the book, was I took a full week right in the midterm and I held basically teacher student conferences, a lot like what my kids in elementary school are doing, where we go with parents and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I wish the parents could be there. But anyways, um, <laughs> the students would come in, we'd meet one-on-one, -on -one, we would discuss for 15 minutes exactly what was going to class, where the assignments were going, where are they progressing, and how it went. And from that first time doing that this semester, um, I went from pretty low on my teaching excellence up to a full five on all of the, the class experiences. And so these students really reacted strongly to this opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. Granted, my class is only, um, you know, on that one, 
they're pretty low. We're in the teens in terms of numbers. So I don't know how this would implement or scale up to classes that are bigger. Um, hopefully having undergraduate teaching fellows and some assistance would help with, with aid in that in the future. Um, but seeing that come through, the comments from students, the clarity of assignments went, you know, all that went up amazingly. And so that's kind of my experience going forward with this, this little experience here. On to you, Christy. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm Christy Bloxham. I'm an associate professor of practice in the Instructional Technology and Learning Sciences program uh, in Logan. And most of my classes are taught online asynchronously. And one of my biggest concerns for my students was how to give them a safe place to grow and try new things. Uh, we're in a design field and I wanted them to be problem solvers and creators. Uh, and I wanted them to push the envelope and do things better. I think we can do better in our field and I wanted them to do that. But traditional grading and teaching practices were not enabling my students to think outside of the box. Uh, I wanted to take the worry out of the learning process, but not take the motivation out. So I started giving full credit for every assignment as long as they met a competency level that I was comfortable with. And if they were totally off the mark, I would work with them to redo the assignment, which honestly doesn't happen very often. Uh, I quit using rubrics and a lot of examples and instead tried to help them see the problem better and let these students practice solving problems without a fence around the solution. Uh, I saw a complete jump in the quality of the student work that I was getting. And I tried very hard to give good feedback and encouragement for thinking differently. I highlighted good student work and rewarded students through feedback. And in most cases, my students became more motivated to do something different and push the envelope and do something better. Uh, the place that I really saw a difference was in group work. Group work can be challenging for students because they get nervous about, you know, the grade and what, you know, what one student maybe who's not participating can do to their grade. Um, but uh, I do a lot of group of small group work in my online class, but uh, from each of them, and so this enabled them to relax about group work and focus on learning from each other and learning how to participate appropriately without worrying about their group grades. So in every class, I do mid-course evaluations to find out how things are going. And every time my students say how much they're enjoying their group work and how much they're learning from each other. Uh, and one of the comments on my spring mid-course evaluation said, I enjoy the, the creativity an amount of leeway that the professor offers, that we can kind of take what we're given and interpret most of the content on our own while following the guidelines. I honestly have not had a class that offers this kind of content and interpretation before, so I really appreciate that. It allows me to be as creative as I can. And that was really one of my goals and has really helped. Key takeaways for me have been that we've had an overall improvement in the quality of student work, which was a surprise. Uh, I've had a switch for students to now be motivated to push themselves rather than to meet the minimum standards to get the grade that they wanted. Um, greater creativity and problem solving, more enjoyment for my students, especially with group work. And I feel this type of ungrading has been highly effective in helping me prepare students for the workforce by allowing them a safe place to make mistakes, but also think outside the box when solving problems. Thanks, Christy. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Sheen. I'm a, an assistant professor in the social work department. Some of you may be a bit skeptical about this title of the book as I was. And I think for me, it boils down to you know, there's an institutional requirement that we input a grade into Banner at the end of the semester. And really for me, what this book did, it wasn't like throwing grades out. It was what you do on the front end that leads to a grade that has to go in for the institution. And it was really a shift in your mindset from rating and sorting students by arbitrary point totals and the equate to grades and really focusing your teaching on uh, teaching for learning and mastery. That's something that we talked a lot of that. So I started to take some of the concepts. There was two um, points that I kind of entry points for me into this. And I, I dabbled a little bit last semester. I've got bigger plans for the fall. 
One of them was this idea of delayed marks, which really equates in our world to kind of the revise and resubmit language. And the idea behind that, and there's some research from a, a woman named Ruth Butler who did this in the late 80s. And she compared students' performance for, for students that received comments only on their work, comments and grades, and grades only. And surprisingly, it wasn't the comments and grade group that performed the best. It was the students that only received comments. Because what happens is they focus right on the point total. They focus right on the grade. And they don't really bring in the feedback that they're given. So I started working with that. I think it's very important to be upfront with your students what you're doing and more importantly, why you're doing it because they've all been raised in the banking model of education where there's like, hey, there's a system, don't disrupt my system. I know how to learn. I, I, I'm all about my grade and my points. And this is really shifting the mindset to helping your students level up toward mastery. And I love that. It is more work. And the, the book will be very clear about this is more work for the instructor, but it's better work, in my opinion. It changed my relationship to my weekend grading instead of like, is this a 93 or an 89? No, it was like, what's the feedback that's going to help this student level their work up, whether they're starting at a high level or they're a lower level than we need them to be. So and then the other piece, I'll just say there's this idea in the book that it really explores collaborative grading. And I'm incorporating that in the fall where really it's more of a portfolio base where I'll sit down at the end and the students have clear expectations on each assignment of what constitutes mastery. And we'll review how close did they get to that? Did they respond to feedback? And what do they honestly think their grade should be? And we'll kind of go from there. So it's an approximation of ungrading. There's a lots of ways to do this. We all discovered that you can go all in or you can kind of dabble. So that's what I'll share. Thank you. And I'm Elisa Taylor, and I joined this reading group because it was the book of the learning circles that I was least comfortable with. Um, I guess like John, I felt like I really had to stretch um, to, to accept the concept of ungrading because I was raised in the system where grading is the norm, and that is what you do. And uh, as a student, I very much would strive to get that A grade and to you know, be a good student and to do all of that was required of me. Um, and as I read some of the concepts of the book, one of the things that they talk about is that students will do the minimum amount required to get an A. And I began wondering if that was true of myself. Did I do the minimum level of work just to get an A? And, or did I push myself? And I really think that I, I tend to work really hard to, to learn what the material is and to know it very well. But I do find myself, you know, studying at the last minute to cram for exams sometimes or um, doing things that, that all students do um, to just make the grade. And so there were some things about this that made me a little bit uncomfortable and some things that really resonated with me. Um, one of the other concepts that is discussed in the book is about how having a lot of feedback for students who are struggling in class, how that can be really discouraging to them, to show them all of the ways that they have done things wrong. And so taking that element out and having them focus on one or two things or a handful either that they have set as goals for, for themselves in the class or things that you can see that if they would just learn those concepts and master those concepts, they'd be able to make some improvements in their next submission. And so that really spoke to me um, because I've been kind of doing some, some research on cognitive science and um, how people can handle what they're learning and, and approach things in a different way. And so that really spoke to me as well, that if you kind of remove the grade on early assignments, then that opens a path for helping students make progress where they need to make progress. And we all need to make progress somewhere. And so just finding those areas and helping students target things that will help them to achieve uh, greater results in the class really makes a difference for them in the long run and achieving the goals and outcomes in the class. Um, the other thing that I took away from this is it's okay to have uh, some kind of a thing at the end 
um, to determine if they've met those competencies. And the goal is to have all of your students meet all of the competencies. You want them all to get an A. You want them all to pass the class and uh, achieve those goals. And so um, it really paves the way for doing that a little bit more efficiently. Thanks, Elisa. So does anyone have questions for us? Because we left quite a bit of time here in the hopes that you would have questions about some of the specifics or some of the things we're thinking about continuing or just about the book that we can help you with. And you can ask it of all of us or direct it to specific panel members. Can I make a comment? This yep. is really good for me. I've, I've been exploring, well, for a few years, um, moving towards ungrading, but first not having the vocabulary of, you know, what was it I was doing other than I was trying to move away from what I saw were harmful practices. And I was trying to promote more cooperation among my students instead of competition and having, and, and I was dealing with, it, it was when I was teaching on the, the U.S. Mexican border and, and kind of, you know, working with a, with a, a group of students who were mostly disadvantaged and it's like, you know, what's the, what's the best thing I can do for them? Um, and, and, you know, how can I help them learn the most? So that's how, how I was moving towards it. Um, but actually implementing it, my fear was, oh, I'm going to get in trouble because, you know, I, I had been trained up as, you know, you're teaching rigorous courses, a C is average, and you should have this bell curve distribution. And what I found was, you know, as I get students working together and we try to all succeed as a group and help each other along, that, you know, I don't get a bell curve distribution and I don't get a C average. Um, and that scared me for a while. And I, and I kept thinking, oh, I'm gonna get in trouble here. You know, I'm kind of looking over my back. And so, when I saw that, oh, there are other, other teachers at the university doing this uh, and they're not fired, it, it, it was just a great relief to me. So that's my comment. You did see the name of our group or what we named ourselves, the Ungrading Underground. We even have little <laughs> stickers that are on our laptops and our coffee mugs. There you go, there's a demo from Jeff. Yeah, it does, it does feel very rebellious and, and dangerous at times. But it, it goes back to the goals um, of learning. And I think there's been quite a few questions in the chat that we will respond to, but I think it goes back to that desire that you mentioned, Kevin, for learning as opposed to grading. I would rather see my whole class finish with an A, knowing that they have actually learned something than I would by sorting them into some A's, some B's, some C's. Assuming that all of these students at the end are going to graduate. I would rather graduate a group of students that have truly learned, even if that means they all get A's, than a group of students that, well, if they've got a C, did they learn enough to really be out there in the workforce doing what you know we've been training them to do? So for me, it's, it's really that driver for learning that really matters here. And, and I'd like to add to Donna's comment, the other aspect that we've many of us have introduced is the peer review, which goes along with what you were talking about, Kevin, is getting the entire group to support each other and getting crit critiques and constructive criticism. I really emphasize that um, they, they really help each other master and learn. And, and one of the things that you need to be aware of we still all have to give grades at the end of the semester just like everybody else we don't get to I tried believe me I, I just happened to be married to the provost and did try the so provost Gailey can we go like gradeless at USU the answer was not only no but a very definite no so we still have to work through ways to while we're looking at ungrading specific assignments we're not necessarily ungrading the entire class. We're just looking at different ways for assessing the student performance, not, not assessing student performance. We're looking more at mastery grading, um, most of us, I think, than 
completely just ignoring grades altogether. So that's how we hold them accountable. If they don't achieve mastery, not only do they not get their A, they may get nothing for an assignment. That's where the accountability comes in. So I think there's one of the questions, like how do you connect this to like assignment development, that kind of stuff. One of the classes that I'm really trying to do this in this year is, is to really connect back to my uh, learning course objectives. And my objectives are based on some of the certifications that are out there. Um, and I asked students at the first of the semester to look at the specific learning outcomes of the course. And the first assignment is for them to say, which of these, because there's six, which of these are the top two that you'd like to work on? And as I start planning out my one-on-one -on -one meetings for them, um, they have to submit that assignment. And then in that one-on-one -on -one meeting or the, the ch chance to meet with them somehow, um, I ask them, so where are you in relationship to these two goals that you identified? How are you going to meet these expectations? Because in the work field, that's exactly what they'll be asked to do in a lot of ways is to say, hey, you said that you're going to be doing this before. What kind of action did you take to implement this so that you could actually achieve your, out your desired outcomes? That way they become more outcome driven or goal driven than uh, anything else. And I, and I kind of saw this last year when I uh, tried to do something I didn't realize I was doing it and it, it worked out super well in terms of keeping them accountable because they start keeping themselves accountable and they actually start asking each other, hey, what are you working on? And it kind of keeps them, it, it creates this really cool community of, of growth and development. Can I jump in real quick? I just want to go, go back to Sarah's original uh, question. I think it's a big, broad question. Uh, we all, all of us are welcome or very willing to talk to anybody about this for, we'll, we'll yeah, talk your ears off at some point. But um, Sarah asked if this was good for beginning teachers. And I would say, in my opinion, absolutely, because it ties to your overarching philosophy of why you're teaching and how you're approaching teaching. And are you uh, kind of reinforcing this system of arbitrary points and grades because that's the way that you, you learn and how everybody else is learning? And, and you know, students are trained to perform for points. And this is about getting students disrupting, like Christy said, it's, it's uncomfortable because it's new, but they have to learn and you get to learn alongside them how to teach for mastery how to help them level up. So it's not about a reducing point mentality as you're grading. It's about how do I help the student through good solid feedback level up their performance wherever they're starting at. And I think that's an important piece. So I think it's absolutely appropriate for beginning teachers to be thinking through these ideas and tie it to their philosophy. And Jeff, that's a great point because like if you think about what's taught in the connections, the, the connections 1010 course about becoming a learner, um, this idea of ungrading connects specifically back to what they're taught when they first come into Utah State is to really go above and beyond, but just like to, to ignite that fire of, of, of learning and discovery. And that's what I loved about this book is it because it puts it gives you the vocabulary, gives you some of that the license to kind of explore and, and go. So yeah, sure. Perfect. And there's a couple of questions in here about how I do groups and how I support them. And I really uh, do coach my students when they're in a group. I don't just put them in a group and say, okay, you know, go. I always let them know that if there are any problems, I'm willing to help, um, help manage those things. And we've had some, and sometimes that happens. Um, but uh, one of the things that I do is that I have them rate their weekly um, effort in their groups from one to 10. And it's actually points that they get and so the first time I do it, they're always like, oh, shoot, I didn't know I was going to get rated um, or I had to rate myself. And, you know, they'll, they're usually pretty hard on themselves. But, but the second time they do it, they always the first time they say, I may have only done, you know, five or six effort this week, but I won't do that again. And the next week uh, when they're rating themselves, it's almost always better. And yeah, it's an honor system. And every once in a while, I'll get somebody who rates themselves high when I know they're not doing the work. But the truth of it is, it makes a difference when they know someone, uh, when they know they have to be a little bit accountable. And so that has helped um, with the effort in my groups. Uh, I also coach them and let them know you're, you know, you're going to get full credit with this uh, when you turn it in, unless it's not what, you know, it's not up to to the standards that I've set. 
and then I'll talk to you about it and we'll redo it and I'll give you a chance to to work on it again and I do when that happens so it's really made a big difference in my groups as far as uh, students uh, participating, giving their all, and they're really proud of their work when they get done usually and excited about what they, what they um, have produced as a group. There's several comments in there about some examples um, of some of the things we're doing or uh, are we doing like complete, incomplete, which is where I've started um, with a lot of their assignments. If they demonstrated mastery, they got a complete on an assignment. If they didn't, they were asked to go back again and redo with some feedback until they got to the complete. If they chose not to, then they were left at an incomplete, which was basically a zero. So it really puts some of the onus for the learning, I think, back on the students a little bit too. You can give them the feedback, say you have this opportunity, so not everyone will get an A in a class. Um, some of them will fail, even on an ungrading, if that is their choice to do so. But I think what this does is it sets it up so everyone can learn if they want to learn um, and encourages them to do so. So one of the things I'm doing is I do a, a combination web broadcast asynchronous course and I'm encouraging my students to make sure they've done their reading before they come by not so much giving them a quiz, but creating a little escape game for each set of reading. They cannot, they can't do it like they would a quiz. They can't take it and say, oh yeah, well, I failed. So they have to master the content before they can get out of the game and get their mastery credit for doing so. And it forces them back. It gives some hints about where to go, where to find the right information if they're getting something wrong. So that it's not about whether or not they've memorized material, but they are understanding about how to go back, how to look for answers, where to find them, how to learn. So that's one of my things that I'm trying is taking a quiz, but making a quiz fun, but making it so they cannot finish a quiz until they've got all the answers. And can I jump back in? I just saw one from Alan about um, students responding negatively, receiving B's or C's at the end. And I think it goes along with what Donna is saying. Um, there's a very important component of the, the, the front end of how you're going to be doing things and what their responsibility is. And so for me, at the end of the semester, I will sit with the students. There'll be, there's a checklist that they're going to bring to this little you know, 15, 20 minute discussion where they can see and they have to bring the evidence of why they does. So if they get a B or C, it should be no surprise because throughout the semester, they are understanding. So I have some things in my fall semester, which are like, um, there's a mastery expectation is you get 12 out of the 16 quizzes at a 90% or more. My quizzes, you can take multiple times because I'm interested in learning, not points but there's an expectation. So they know where they're at in that ballpark. On the written assignments, you have to have them at a complete stage, which means you responded to my revisions and moved them from incomplete to complete. And if we sit down and you had three key writing assignments that you never moved beyond incomplete, it should be no surprise to you that you're not in the A category at that, as part of that conversation. I also think there's plenty of opportunity during the semester to flag these things early, like to see that, hey, you know, this first assignment that was a month due, like, due a month ago, you've never moved it to complete. What are your intentions? What do you, what do you need more help with? What support do you need? So I think it's, it should never be a surprise. And the book certainly doesn't make it. It's not like a surprise you got to see. It's uh, looking at your body of work. Where do you honestly think you would be on this, on these criteria? I want to respond jump in here real quick too. Also, many of us had integrated student self-reflection where they say, and, and like um, Christy was mentioning, grade themselves. And they're really hard on themselves. I asked them, you know, what grade do you think you deserve for this portfolio? And they would say, oh, you know, I only should get a C. I, I just didn't work that hard. I don't think I did what, when they saw other work, you know, they saw what other students had contributed. So it's not just everybody gets an A, um, but I'm usually not as hard on them as they are, but they have to demonstrate mastery. It's not just given a grade because they were there. So a lot of my assignments, um, 
it's project based so they have to bring in examples of the work they're doing and one of, this is just remember uh, a memory i had i had a student when i was first my first semester here she had to create a, a flyer for an event and i had to redo it over 17 times and she was so angry with me. She was spitting, swearing up one side down the other. And then what was great though, is in her first job, she had to do the same assignment, the same exact thing. And that boss required her to do it 17 to 20 times changing it up. And she apologized after the fact that, hey, you know, what we were learning was real world. It was real experience. And the feedback you gave me, I didn't learn from it the first time. And it nipped me in the butt well, my job the next time. I'm never going to do that again. So hopefully what they're doing is from this experience, they're getting that, that feedback that would happen in their job or even in their, their personal life. And then they'll be able to make that connection. Sometimes it doesn't happen until a couple of years later. Yeah. And I want to respond to Sean's comment when he said, isn't this everyone getting a trophy mindset? And that when our students get to jobs, you know, are they really going to be successful? And um, I can see where you can think that. However, what I want to create in my classroom is a chance for them to solve problems, to have the opportunity to solve problems in creative ways and use the knowledge that they're gaining um, to build something new and to do something better. And uh, when we talk with many of our industry uh, folks, one of their biggest concerns about students coming out of college is that they don't have those skills. And trying to teach those in a classroom where you where you dictate exactly how everything should look or, you know, set, you know, a rubric that says, OK, you have to do this, this, this and this. But there's no room for any growth there. There's no room for any um, real problem solving or real creativity or using the knowledge that you have to create something new. And by giving them a safe place to practice that here, uh, hopefully we'll encourage them uh, and give them the confidence when they get to the workforce to be able to use those skills. And those are the skills that will actually make them more successful rather than, you know, rote knowledge that they, that they learned. I think to add to that um, real quick is for me, the, the things that are discussed in the book and, and what I got out of it was it's really about ownership of learning uh, and, and helping students take that on. It's not my learning that is being evaluated. It's their learning and it's their opportunity to really take charge. And, and it, like Jesse said, go back to that fundamental thing of becoming a lifelong learning and, and having a space to really try some of these things out. I found that my students actually put in a greater effort versus um, just coasting through because they start to take more and more responsibility. It's not my job every Saturday to just give them a 93 or an 89 it's their job to level up to the expectation of mastery based on feedback that I give them. So I feel like it elevated my teaching engagement. I feel like it elevated my students' engagement with the coursework. Um, and I'm just dipping a toe in this. I'm not all in like Donna quite yet, but um, that's my two cents. There's a question in the chat that asks about, is this more of a time burden for the students? I'm trying to set my class up in a way that part of that time that they're going to spend doing their sort of pre-reading assessment is accounted for in my class time. Um, so it's not by any means my goal to make it more time intensive for them. I feel like it's probably way more time intensive for me as an instructor it's up to them. Some of them will choose to make it more time intensive, I think, because they've been given the freedom to do something different than just study and take a quiz. Like, like Carla's student that put that amazing amount of work into the Jeopardy game. But I'm sure she probably learned more from doing that game and creating that game than she would ever have learned from studying and taking the quiz. So it, you know, it depends on the student, I think, whether they will choose to to go overboard, but there were other students that still did equally as well as that student with their portfolios without the same level of time input. So it's going to be really student dependent, I think. What do you guys think? 
Well, I think that's one of the reasons why I really like group work too, is I can, I can push them to higher levels of learning when I spread out the work a bit, you know, within the group. And so, although one person may be taking a portion of that work, they're all working together to solve the problems and try and figure out, you know, what the design should be or, or what's best for the client or what, or, you know, whatever the, whatever the group project can be. And so I think it has eliminated, you know, the fact that they have to do the full project all by themselves, but they still learn from the process. And so for me, that's why one of the reasons why I do like group work is to try and uh, lower the overall amount of work for a student in a course. Another thing I think somebody asked earlier about the types of assignments that are good for this. And one of the things that I found as a theme throughout the book is that it tends to be on larger assignments where substantial feedback is given. There are things that students might do in the real world. Um, there are things that students might do in a job later on. And so it's gonna be things that are gonna be relevant to those students. And if they can gain a passion for that in your class while they're um, working on it, then that time that is invested is gonna pay them back um, when they go to do their job or when they go to uh, do their career later on. And so I think you can take a little bit of shame or guilt away from yourself because you're actually focusing them on real world experiences and assignments that are gonna be more applicable to them in the long run. And, and you're not gonna spend time giving them good feedback or a lot of feedback on stuff that's just little one and two here and there types of activities. And so I think that is one of the differences in um, just the time and effort that is being spent. I think that goes along with what Jesse said earlier too, that his class focuses so much on experiential learning. Um, and if you really think about it, do our students go out into the workforce and have to take a quiz and not be able to go look up the answers? I don't think we ever expect them when they're out in the workforce to have everything memorized. What we do expect is for them to be able to learn, be able to search, be able to find answers. And I think this encourages that sort of behavior in the students. So when they go into the workforce, they're, they're better able to do these things on their own without relying on us to give them all the answers. I really like Kevin's comment there. There's a question about cheating. And uh, the one thing I've really enjoyed is that because there's so many different ways and pathways to learn that our students, at least my students, um, the, the other students will keep them in a way a little bit more honest. Um, and it's harder to cheat because they have to represent their ideas specifically to their peers in an open environment. It's not behind uh, the, the wall of Canvas on a quiz. So you can tell pretty quickly who's got the knowledge and who doesn't. And students then also learn in future projects that might come up in other classes of who they might want to be working with and who they might not want to. Um, and so it puts pressure on the students. I think a good pressure the to, to push them towards excellence as they do their projects. I agree. Okay, Somebody ask about them about out of time. Of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yep, John. We're just about out of time, Christy. So let's go ahead and just wrap this up and address the last questions. And then we can, I'll go ahead and end the recording, but we can stick around for a few minutes and still answer any questions or in the chat. So go ahead and Christy. Thanks. Uh, some of you have asked, you know, I have bigger classes, could I do it with larger classes? And I think you do have to be creative because it can become a real time drain when you're giving a lot of feedback. But, you know, I'm gonna go back to groups instead of, you know, I put them in groups of six. So that cuts down on the amount of grading that I'm doing right there. But there are other things you can do as far as peer grading or other things like that to really help reduce some of the time that it might take to do to do some of these uh, different techniques. Yes. All right. Thank you all for this presentation. That was extremely interesting. I I will give the final word if I if I may. <laughs> um, I want to address something that Donna said, where she turned to the provost and said, "Can I do this? Can I not do grades in my class?" I, I've worked here for uh, four different provosts during my tenure at USU. And the one thing that, that I have learned from all of them 
is that they do not discourage innovation and attempting these new ideas to improve teaching. However, what they uh, ask is that for those of you going up for tenure or promotion, is that you document and have some intentionality of why you are doing what you're doing. And that helps you to be resilient. If, you're, if it completely blows up and your students just hate the class and your evaluations are horrible, you can come back and say, I participated in this learning circle of ungrading. It was a really interesting experiment. Here's what I did. It may or may not have resulted in the outcomes that you'd expected. Um, but this is what I learned from it, and here's how I can reflect on it, and here's how I will change or improve moving into the future. That's what they've expressed to be the most important thing. So, so I wholly you know, expect that you all continue to try these new different ways, and please don't feel threatened by failing in these ways. Um, use you know, evidence-based practices like we have here. And, uh, and I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for this presentation. It's a very interesting topic to discuss. All right, I'll stop the recording and you can stick around for the rest if, you, if any of the presenters want to.